Um, so uh, I'll discuss, I'll do the first part and I'll talk about the new glibc condition variable. Um, there were POSIX requirements or clarifications about POSIX requirements that uh, uh, required us to build a new algorithm. Uh, I'll talk about how blocking with few taxes makes this complicated and I'll give a brief overview of the algorithm. So this will be a bird's eye view and the things that there are lots of details and we are, there are more details than we have time for but I guess our goal is that um, you get a bit more aware of the problem and we maybe get to discuss this a little bit and uh, we certainly won't solve it today but uh, uh, it's, I think it's good to have the conversation. And <laughs> Sorry. And Darren then will um, do the second part talking about the actual um, problem for how to support PI with the new condition variable. So, um, quick reminder of what the condition variable is. So, it's a way to wait for a certain condition to hold. So, you have um, a thread that does the waiting. So, and it grabs a lock, and then while the condition does not hold, uh, it calls this conduit operation, pthread conduit. And this one atomically, so uh, specified to atomically release the mutex and start waiting, right? And it returns only after reacquiring the mutex. The signaling side then optionally, and as is good practice, acquires the lock, sets the condition to true, and signals, right? We have uh, this while loop there because the condition variable is allowed to, so this, this p thread conway is allowed to wake up spuriously. So that's the thing that we want to implement. Now, right, the problematic thing though is that um, the condition variable is not a counter. It's not like a semaphore or a lock, right? Which either has tokens in it and a semaphore or not, or which is acquired or is not. The condition variable is essentially an order of events. And this is what POSIX clarified, and this is also what C14 specifies in terms of uh, requirements on condition variables. So the requirement there is that the signals, um, they must wake threads or one of the waiters that started before them. And the reason is that a program can observe or construct an ordering of waiters and signals. And this is because the mutex is released atomically with starting to wait. And the, pro the, the contour implementation of the algorithm, the synchronization that we do, then must adhere to any ordering that the program may have observed. So if you look at the small figure down here below, right, if this is a sequence of, of an ordering of events that the program could have observed, right, it means that this signal here must wait exactly one of those two writers. Waiters, sorry. It must not wait, uh, must not wake the second waiter. The last signal, S2, is allowed to wake uh, W1 to W3. That's not a problem. And you see that this is here the ordering that I'm talking about. Oh. I'll give that a try. Uh, S1 can wake W1 and 2. S2 can wake all of them. There you go. So the, the errors are the ordering requirements, or they determine the, the eligibility, right? So in this case, um, for signal as 1, waiter 1 and waiter 2 are eligible to wake up. And so the converse synchronization must model an order of waiters and signalers. And so as I already mentioned, there's a set of eligible waiters that it has to adhere to. And only those are allowed to consume a signal. And the problem with the uh, previous um, condition variable implementation of GLIPC was that we could violate that. You know, not with two waiters maybe, but with three waiters there was a problem and we actually got bug reports from users and so on and so forth. So what then we do, so I then went to the Austin group and to ISO C++, asked them what they think, they clearly said they want these semantics and they want this ordering to preserve. So I built a new uh, condition variable algorithm. The first attempt that I tried didn't actually work and now I have a second one <coughs> that uh, I think works and that is now currently under testing and review. 
So how do we actually do that? Right? So let's start simple and say that, OK, we don't do any kind of kernel level blocking at all. We just do spin weighting. And in that case, it's uh, rather simple to do. Because then we can just say the ordering that we saw down at the bottom, this is just a sequence, right? So we ignore all the partial order thing and say it's a total order and it's a sequence. And then the eligibility for wake up is determined just through a sequence of waiters, so which we call WSIC, uh, which can be as simple as a shared counter. And waiters in the condition uh, pthread conduit implementation basically do three steps. So the first is that they look at any kind of sequencing and ordering that the program might have observed. So here in our example, they acquire precision in uh, WSeq, for example, by incrementing the counter, right? And then they become eligible for signals that happen afterwards, right? Signals can also observe this, this counter and the sequencing. For example, right. Um, then they release the mutex, right? And then they actually start spinning. <coughs> we'll see later that one problem here is that the order that we observe in, the, in step one does not necessarily um, match the order that we have for calls to futex weight, for example. That creates this all kind of interesting problems here. But with the spinning, it's not a problem, right? Because we're always spinning, and we can just stick to our order that we uh, determined in step one. So what signalers then do um, is that if the number of signals sent, so S sent, is uh, larger or equal to uh, the number of waiters that we had so far, then they just need, don't need to do anything because there's no waiter. Otherwise, they just increment the number of signals sent and then one of the waiters spin waiting on s end will just see that it's its turn and it will go, right? So this is similar to a ticket lock. But, and, but the trivial implementation with immediate futex calls will work. With immediate futex calls? Uh, so, so Do you want to have the... So do you keep... So Peter, he is going to describe some of the failures in that mode on so the next slide. The, the Im where um, the block will do a futex wait immediately without spinning, and the signal is a futex wake, because the, the spurious wake-ups were allowed. A wake will never wake something that is not waiting, therefore your ordering is preserved. Um, if you do not do the spinning, it doesn't change anything. You can be preempted right before you do the comparison of the futex word against the value that is expected in the futex weight call. So it, it doesn't change a thing. Uh, you never change the value for the conveyor. No, well, I mean, if you do the futex weight call, right, the kernel will eventually load the value, the current value of the futex word, and compare it against the expected value. Which should always be uh, true, otherwise we don't go to sleep. Right, but this is the problem. This is like spinning. And, and I'll, I'll show you in the next slides why, it, why there's a problem you there. You go back and then you consume it, but you should consume it. Next, let, let, me, let me ask in two slides more, okay? If it becomes clear, not, not clear enough. So what the spinning does is resulting in a simple FIFO wake up. Okay, so far so good. And timeouts and cancellation, which adds more fun to all of this, we can model like sending artificial signals, right? So that's, we can deal with that. Now, the first attempt at using futexes. Instead of spin waiting, we want to call futex wait eventually with uh, s send as futex word, right? So if there are not enough signals sent for us, we want to sleep. The problem, however, is as I mentioned previously, that um, the wake up order, in, so for the futexes, <coughs> does not necessarily match the order that we uh, determined when we uh, set the, the waiter sequence and acquired our position in the sequencing of waiters. So step one and step three um, on this slide here in the middle, right? Step one, the order is not the same as step three, the order necessarily because we can be preempted in the middle and so on and so forth. So and the reason is for that, that we do the futex wait after releasing the mutex, right? Which we have to, obviously, 
because we need to allow for others to make progress, right, before we actually block everyone out. And the Futic system itself provide no wake up ordering guarantees in the non-PI case, at least according to the specification. And in the PI case, we have, don't have a means to tell the Futex wake us up in this particular order, right? There could be, for example, they awake and in priority order, and things like that. Which is the right? Uh, which is A, good semantics, not sufficient for what we need to do here. Right. And um, we don't want to wake all the threads blocked on the f uh, in the Futex wait, because that would obviously be bad for performance. Then every p thread con signal would be a p thread con broadcast. And we don't need a condition variable for that. We can do anything else that is uh, better. Um, now, one possible workaround is that we could be clever and say, OK, eligibility for wake up can also be argued when uh, a futex wait actually happens before a futex wake, right? Because then clearly parts of the wait were before the signal. So far, so good. What can happen, though, then, is that waiters wake up if ascent is uh, larger than their position in the waiter sequence. So this is the spin waiting side, which could also happen through the comparison on, uh, on the Futex weight. And they also wake up uh, if Futex weight returns like, you know, returns zero. So as in any other situation where a Futex weight really uh, woke it up. Does this work, right? Um, does anybody have a question? Or in the interest of time, we can already tell you that it does not work. Obviously. So the first bug is that um, the difference between the number of waiters that we have and the number of signals uh, we sent in this case can be smaller than the number of waiters uh, that are actually blocked. So the program can count with accurate knowledge and so on how many waiters are actually still blocked in the, uh, on the condition variable. And it can legally and correctly only send that many signals to um, wake up the remaining ones. Now, if two waiters wake because one con signal of because of one con signal call, so one through actually observing uh, the shared memory value of signal sent, and the other through the few text wait, then S sent is not incremented by two but by one. So in the end, S sent is too small and we can get lost wake-ups. Now can you think about workarounds, right? Can waiters actually increment ascent if the Futex weight returns zero? Well, they can, but then the problem is that the con signal check that we have to not have unnecessary uh, calls to, to, Futex, uh, to Futex wake and to actually incrementing signals uh, will hit early, right? And so, what, so one, one of them might not run which also means that we have one Futex wake call missing. And so we have, you know, if we try to work around one of the things, we have another created a problem elsewhere. Maybe we are able to uh, count these events and try to find a workaround. However, any kind of workarounds, and I looked at this for, for, for a couple of days, <laughs> was really bad and it was really hard for performance. Only a couple of days. Well, there were a lot of them. <laughs> And I'm not counting the, the, the time that I spent before on that. Um, so they will have result in spurious convo wake-ups, so bad performance. And it gets even worse than that. And this is that we can't distinguish spurious Futex wake-ups from non-spurious ones. Now you always say, well, did the Futex implementation, the kernel, doesn't wake up spuriously. And you would be right. The problem, however, is uh, a combination of uh, POSIX and C++ requirements for when you can destroy mutexes and condition variables and, the gen and combining that with the general Futex design. So POSIX requires that mutexes can be destroyed as soon as no thread is blocked anymore on the mutex. Same for condition variables and barriers and so on. The general Futex design in return means that we have a user space fast path and this fast path and the actual mutex operations in the kernel are not one atomic step. So they can happen at different times. Now, because of this end memory use, 
we can get spurious uh, Futex wake-ups in practice. So what happens is that thread one, for example, releases a mutex in user space, then gets suspended, right? So before it can do the Futex wake call. Then thread two acquires the mutex in user space, destroys it, and reuses the memory for another Futex. And then thread one gets, uh, gets resumed again, calls Futex wake, and this Futex wake hits a different unrelated Futex variable. It happens to be at the same address, but it's not the same thing. Then we get in practice a spurious Futex wake up, which is not a problem for all the you know, Mutex implementations on that we have, because the way the synchronization problem is on an abstract level is that they can, uh, they can, you know, they are, it's harmless, right? Um, but for the condition variable in particular, in the first attempt that we had, it's a problem. Because if we can't distinguish between the spurious and the non-spurious one, we're back to having the first problem. But it's even worse because we don't even have any kind of, you know, we don't know whether a con signal happened or not. Okay. But cons, uh, if that con wait was allowed to wake spurious, it's just never run. Yeah, we can wake all of them, and this, then we are back to really awful performance. And if, you know, we're in, a, we're in a bad place here because we cannot decide, you know, what was it? We have the error on the conservative side. And then we actually, you know, we break everybody else. And it's, it's not nice. So. Got a question. When yeah. Uh, for us, I'm missing something big, but uh, can, can, can't you? Sorry. OK, so I'm, perhaps I'm missing something, but can you implement a FIFO queue in user space that would keep track so every waiter that gets pushed onto wait basically link itself into this queue and uh, the wake up, actually the queue and wake one. So you could do an atomic exchange to enqueue a waiter, then you'd have your ordering and all would be fine. Uh, I'm just saying a piece of uh, process shared condition variables. So POSIX allows for condition variables, mutex, and so on to operate in a process shared, where you just map the variable, but you don't have any extra space that you could use. In the process private case, yes. The process private case is different because we can build our own wait queues and we can do stuff, right? Yeah. But a process shared case, there's nothing really we can do. Can we just get rid of it? <laughs> <laughs> So um, the second attempt, um, and this is what I have currently in my patch. Uh, it's uh, quite a bit more complex than uh, the first algorithm, um, but it avoids some of the problems. So the basic idea here is that you maintain groups of eligible and non-eligible waiters, each with their own futex words. And New waiters always start in a non-eligible group, right? So which is, we're limiting this to two groups right now, so this is group G2. In contrast, the eligible group contains only eligible waiters. And each signal always wakes one, some thread in G1. I'm stressing that it's some thread because they're all eligible, so you can wake any of them, which means that from a uh, synchronization perspective, we're back to having something like a counter, right? You can say, okay, is there a signal? And you just say, yes, I'll grab it, right? And this avoids the problem with the ordering because through the groups, we build and you know, represent this partial ordering that we have. And then when group one uh, is completely signaled, Group two becomes the new G1, uh, the new group one. And I have um, tried to use it at the pointer for now. So in this part here, first step, we have just two waiters. This might be the initial state, and we start with one group two, all right? So then, subsequently, a signal comes along, signal one. Uh, and it sees that there's no other group G1. So it makes group G2 into a group G1 and signals some of them, right? Then, next example, so how does it play out? We have a new waiter coming in, W3, and a new signal. The new waiter uh, sees that the uh, 
group one isn't yet completely signaled. So it always just starts into group G2. Here we're, it's a new one. And the, the signal S2 that comes along, where's my mouse pointer, this one, sees, also sees that G1 is not completely signaled. So it just sends the signal to G1 and then makes it completely signaled. And then, last step in this example is that um, eventually when G1, when all the waiters in G1 have confirmed that they have woken up, um, we can make G2 the new G1. And then the, th the third signal can then wait the third waiter. So that's the, the really high level um, perspective on the algorithm. Um, the, the, I don't want to get into the details in this. You can ask me later and I can walk you through all of that. Um, the important part here for us and also for priority inheritance is that we, the groups G1 and G2 are roles mapped to GRU. Uh, sorry, they are, well, <laughs> let me start that sentence again. They are virtual groups, right? They are roles and they are mapped to two fixed group slots in the pthread Conti data structure. There's no sp space in pthread Conti for more than two groups and it's already tight. So what it means is that we need to reuse the memory. So the conver keeps track of which slot has which role. And it always has a G1 for, for waiters to enter. And it also maintains the, the waiter sequence. Right? So the waiters can detect aliasing of groups. But they can only do when you actually look at shared memory. And they cannot do it inside of the Futex wait operations. So reusing a G1 as G2 requires quiescing this particular group to be able to avoid an ABI in the futex weight. So an ABA situation, in case some of you are unaware of it, is, some, is a name for something that you often find in synchronization problems is where you have values representing um, states, right? And you say, okay, you see a value of A and you think it's, it's state X, right? And then you have a value of B, something else changes and then you, somebody else again sees a value of A. But this value of A doesn't need to represent the old state. It can represent the new state. This is what we call an ABA problem. For example, in a linked list, right, if you remove in a concurrent linked list, if you remove nodes, you might see the same pointer, but it actually might be a different, uh, different node in the list after memory use and so on. The ABA in this problem uh, is that you see a number of signals and one signals, one, one value that you see, for example, for there are no signals available in this group, is the same value that you see if it's actually a reused group, right? So we need to quiesce. Rick? And the mysterious wake up, um, oh, can a mysterious wake up result in a task accidentally moving from G1 to G2? Uh, no. So I mean, this, because we have the counters, and the, because if we reduced it to a countering problem, the spurious wake-ups are not a problem for when you just need to count, right? When you actually need to find out is it non-serial, the, the number of signals that you have available. So we need to avoid this ABA problem, so we need to quiesce futex wake calls, which means that we need confirmation from all the waiters in the group that if they signal that they started or are, are about to start a futex wake call, that they're not going to do it or that they have finished it. And this is important later on and we'll discuss this later on. Um, the good thing is though that, um, the, for example, the, the, the switch from group two to group one is simple, right? We don't need to change the Futex words. So it's not as inefficient as the complexity might sound. And um, the quiescence is also something that we can do in user space and so on and so forth. So ignoring PI, I'm pretty happy about this uh, algorithm. And now uh, Darren will continue with how it looks if you consider PI. So for any of you that are still following along, we're gonna, we're gonna fix that now. <laughs> okay. Um, so just for a, just a, a quick recap 
when we talk about an unbounded priority inversion, we're looking at this red line here taking an unknown amount of time, preventing the higher priority task from running. And this, this is intended to show a single CPU executing three tasks in time. And the, the general idea is just you have a low priority task running, it gets preempted by a high priority task. The high priority task ends up going to sleep because it needs a resource that the low priority task has. So that's why you see the blue task stop and the green task pick up again. But then while the green task is running with that resource held, the medium priority task is scheduled. And because there's no dependency on that resource, the medium priority task can, go, can run unchecked. And the high priority task is therefore interrupted by a medium priority task until such time as the medium priority task relinquishes the CPU. And then the low priority task can complete, release the resource, and then the high priority task can run. Um, what priority inheritance is intended to do is to shorten that red period because it will in turn boost the priority of the low priority task, which will then preempt the medium priority task and make that a minimal. Okay, that was just sort of required background. Okay, um, with few Texas, uh, we have, uh, with few Texas and priority inheritance, we had two goals. I say had because this was in 2009 when we went to attack priority inheritance in few Texas with Convars initially. So the way a signal would work is on, your le on the left, um, when a signal would happen, we'd wake a single task, and then it, it, it would lock, take the mutex in user space. Um, the problem was that, w one of the problems, w was that we wanted to be able to avoid a thundering herd where, because we couldn't requeue directly to a, um, to a priority inheritance mutex, which has an RT mutex as its back end inside the kernel, is we would have to wake every single task that was blocked. And so we'd have to wake them all up, and then they would all contend, and then the rest of them would go back to sleep. So that led to a lot of unnecessary wake-ups and then going back to sleep. Um, we also wanted to make sure, though, that we woke up the highest priority eligible waiter. And I say eligible to refer back to Torvald's representation of eligible being everything behind um, the uh, the, the, the observed order in, in the application. So everything behind S1 um, when S1 is, is issued. Um, implementation restriction. So I mentioned that we had to wake everything instead of just waking one. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for that um, is that in order to use an R, in order to queue to an RT mutex, RT mutexes cannot be in a state where they do not have an owner, but that they have waiters. Because if you're in that state, then you have waiters that need to get boosted to the priority of the owner, but you have no owner. So, so that's an invalid state, which we had to avoid. So what we implemented was um, some, in, the gray box represents the kernel. So what we implemented was a, if this cuts out, is that the battery? I don't know. Um, Inside the kernel, we allowed us to requeue from a normal Futex to a Futex with a RT mutex backing it. And we would do that inside of the kernel. And as we woke, we would take ownership of that mutex. And what that meant is we never left the PI, the RT mutex in a state with waiters and no owner. However, um, this imposes a couple of challenges. Uh, one is that PI Futexes enforce a policy on the, on the Futex word. So the Futex word cannot be used for anything else because it is used to encode the TID of the owner and whether or not there are waiters. And so that's how we reflect that state within the kernel to user space. Um, so, um, Um, we, in terms of considerations for this problem, we wanted to note that we are only concerned about 
the unbounded priority inversion with respect to the target mutex for the condition variable, as well as any of the locks associated with the locking mechanism itself. One of the nice things about Torvald's new implementation is it eliminates the, previously there was an internal data lock to the CONVAR. And so half of what the glibc modifications that we made originally did was they would take that internal data lock and if, through a non-POSIX modification, we were able to determine that we wanted to later requeue to a PI mutex, we would change that internal data lock to a PI aware lock. Otherwise, we had a secondary priority inversion risk. But he eliminated that internal data lock. So that eliminates half of the glibc changes we needed to make. So that's, that's nice. Um, but we're still faced with the problem of the value encoding in the futex. Um, the other concern is this makes a lot of sense for FIFO and RR, um, but as we go to moving to using SCED, SCED deadline more, it's a little less obvious. Well, e even for FIFO, it's not <coughs> ideal because in, in his previous slides, so, so even for FIFO, it's not ideal because in his previous slides, the S2 um, would only wake W2 because W3 was not yet eligible to wake, whereas W3 might be the highest priority one, and it is eligible to wake, strictly speaking, at S2. Uh, let's go back to his slide, so that we're all talking about the same thing. Yeah, yeah. There's a simpler one. You want the, the group one? Okay. The group one. So, at S2, the only possible wake up is W2 uh, in his scheme. Oh, that's Even true. though W3 might be the highest priority one. You're right. That's and a problem. And that's the one you want to wake. You're correct. But it can't. Not with that scheme. Not in this scheme. No. But so, so sequence wise, but it's it is allowed to wake yeah, it's semantically according to correct. spec. And it is the one we want to wake according to PI rules. Just this scheme does not permit us doing so. Noted. <laughs> um, let's see. I think l <laughs> lastly, um, well, let's see. Torvald, I think I'll move this to, you should probably come up for this part. Um, So, so this is yeah. what I um, touched briefly on before. The problem with the, the quiescence is that we need to avoid the ABA, right? And um, so the threats that ran Futex Wake or are about to try to use a Futex Wake, they need to confirm once they are finished doing that, right? So because when they confirm that they are not going to do that, they, yeah. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when they confirm that they're not doing that, right, we know that we can reuse the memory because only then we have we avoided the ABA because there's nobody in the, in the first A thinking anymore, right? Um, so the first A of the ABA, right? Um, and so we would need to boost priority of threats, but they have not acquired a lock, right? They, they are just there. And um, we can have uh, something like a help of Futex per thread or another way queue because of the process shared converse. Now, when we are saying that, for example, in the real time case, process shared doesn't matter, maybe that's our solution there that we can actually need to build user space weight queues. Might be the easiest thing to do, perhaps, or at least an approach. Futex operation that atomically, from user space perspective, unlocks one Futex and goes wait on another. Would that help? So that would be your three steps all wrapped up in one. So you're saying that, so you're thinking about releasing the, uh, the programs in Mutex and waiting on the other one? Um, yeah, the problem is that everything in between is not. What could help is if we have something like increment the reference count and go uh, go sleep on a few texts or something like that. But you need to increment this waiter count before you unlock. So you have the global sequencing you want. 
So um, the the sequencing that we do before the mutex release is, is one thing, right? The the other thing what I'm what I just mentioned though is that we need to know whether there are pending futex weights and doing having kernel support for figuring out whether they are pending futex weights without running into this uh, problem here with that we cannot boost something for which we don't have a handle. Um, that might help. But if the futex Cisco would unlock and wait atomically, then you already have your correct order for a futex wake. Because if the futex wake will observe anybody in the futex hash bucket, it must have happened before. That's true. So if we then do everything inside the kernel, that's true. But do we want to do that? That I don't know. I'm just saying this. But, but for, for the PI cases, the performance is less of an issue than the functional correctness. For the PI cases, it for might be PI true, case. yeah. Though I think what um, um, just quickly stepping in this direction because it's, it's related. A question that we perhaps really need to ask is, do you really want to have a condition variable, right? Um, we just discussed briefly the case where the different, you know, the ordering constraints for the condition variable specification say one thing and priority says another thing, or FIFO says another thing. So maybe Not we need to think hard about saying, so what actually do you need? Do you really need something perhaps more like a semaphore or like a latch or something like that? So I don't. So POSIX only requires to wake waiters that happened before the signal, which is, I think, a sensible thing. Um, we further require that we not only wake any one waiter, but the waiter with the highest priority as seen by the scheduler function, which is not something user space can determine even if it wanted to. Um, So I don't see POSIX being um, ill-specified here, but the solution you crafted for the CONFAR is sufficient for POSIX, but insufficient for the PI case, because as I previously said, the S2 wake-up should also consider W3 and not only W2. Um, and I'm not saying that yeah. the specifications are incorrect or, you know, poorly chosen. No, I'm no, just I, saying I, I, that... I think I agree with POSIX. I mean, that makes sense, that constraint. It's just that implementing it is slightly awkward, maybe. The problem with the, uh, with the, you know, what you just mentioned is that you cannot easily implement this is that... Um, oh, this one. The problem why I'm crunching uh, S2 into group one is that if you don't do that, the state, the, the memory that you need to actually cover everything that you're allowed to do just is too large, right? Well, yeah. And but that's the problem. So that's where I'm thinking if the Futex ops could help you here by doing the unlock and wait atomically. But that again reduces to always doing the system calls which is something that might not be desirable um, in the generic case. I mean Darren is, ra Darren is I think right I mean maybe we need to do something different entirely for PI but I really want to uh, encourage you to think about what I had here um, even though I already said it uh, once so Yes, the, the requirement that POSIX makes is a sensible one, and I think it's useful for many things, but maybe you don't actually need it, right? In a lot of cases, a semaphore is just as good. And maybe for the, the I don't know what you are using condition variables in the real-time setting for. <laughs> so somebody is making requests for that. This, yeah. or the, the, this person or these people probably should think about, you know, can we do something else yeah, and I get back to you. me? first first the Java people <laughs> okay so I know and they are asking. doing something totally scary they call it real-time Java <laughs> okay here we are <laughs> stop wondering so you know maybe we don't need to solve the hard problem if the simpler problem is easier right but but with respect 
Yeah. <laughs> um, but but is, is there a simple for solution for getting rid of Java? But with respect to Java, I believe the Convars were a requirement for the implementation of their monitor. And they're certainly open to alternatives to that. I mean, they've been doing all kinds of weird things for the monitor for a while. They had the sked yield issue for a long time. Um, and so this was a way but, that they... But Convar was also widely used for all kind of nonsense. Yes, So out, and that's the other point, is outside of Java, it is heavily used in general purpose programming. And one of the advantages of using a real-time Linux kernel is the ability to reuse pre-existing software. But, but it shouldn't need PI. But the period between, so, so the, the period between the wade and the signal should be bound somehow. Also, because if it's unbound, you get, again, unbounded behavior and all your determinism is out the window. It's perfectly deterministic. If you don't call a signal, it's not going to wake. Yeah, very, very good. Um, well, I mean, that's, that's the same. If you don't get an interrupt from the, from the hardware device, you're so, not going to wake. So this, this should basically only be used for external stuff where you're not waiting on software, but on, on yeah, and, and there is no owner, so there's nothing to boost. So, so convars in a real-time and PI scenario are indeed a very dangerous construct, but there are valid use cases, but it's, it's very, very tricky. Yes. <laughs> one, one use case I know about is um, uh, that's where people uh, come up with uh, replacement functions for uh, things found in other operating in other operating systems with keys to exist or or about the keys to exist. So the, the um, OS nine um, had a very similar construct. It's, it's called ki kind of events and it's based. So you can one to one uh, replace it by contours, and that's unfortunately what people used to use for twenty years out there, and they just expect it to work. If it's the best solution, certainly not. But are we going to educate all the people out there? We tried. <laughs> but for example, if it's, if it's events, then maybe a semaphore is sufficient. So did the reason that, that we tried to implement it with semaphores and it didn't work. OK. So it, maybe it we should has, talk offline. It why. has very, very similar semantics and then what the, what the converse have. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately. Oh. Because the interesting thing about the converse is that the, the they're special on that they you can actually detect when somebody started waiting, which you don't, which you can't for any else, anything else like like barriers or semaphores or something like that, and that makes it special here. If we hadn't, if we hadn't had this property, then, you know, it would be much easier synchronization-wise. And uh, the other problem is we can't call the evils back. I mean, it's out there. But the evils don't have PI support for the converse currently, so there's they incentive have. to change. They patch GLIPC. Oh, God. Yes, for seven years. But so well, they have a broken uh, condition variable because it's the old one. Uh, well, <laughs> but their printing presses work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's working, kind of. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, comments, great ideas? Do we need to stop using Kotlin? If you're using them now yeah. um, and you depend on POSIX semantics, yeah. you don't have it, so you should not use them. Um, if, you're not using the, if you're not using the patched version, are you using the patched version? No, I you am, should not. You I should. To decide, so I want to. If you're not using the patched version of glibc, you should not be using convars with a PI mutex yeah. because the internal convar lock is not PI aware, yeah. and so you can you can just hit unbounded priority inversion on that alone. Yeah, it, the, regardless of the first half of the presentation, yeah, the convar yeah. implementation is broken. Maybe it's uh, another question. It's uh, uh, more a question for 
today before you can find a solution because uh, if I see the bug tracker, you, it's uh, about six years now. Seven. Seven? Seven. Okay, so <laughs> uh, practically, if we want to use Conva, uh, we should better use the patch version. You should use the, if you're going to use Convars today, you should use the patch version, but understand that you will have the partial ordering uh, issue where we might order, we might wake um, W3 when we should yeah. only wake W1 or 2. That's the issue today. Okay, so but it's, it's a trade off. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it is a bit of a subtlety, whereas if you, the problem with what we had originally was you would use a PI mutex and intuitively expect that you would be getting priority inheritance. You, you would intuitively expect that you get priority inheritance, but the internal lock would, would mean that you could actually not get it and, and you could suffer from the inversion. And it, it would be difficult to debug because it's a glibc internal, which you never really see. Uh, you've said a couple of times that semaphores could be, is, it's better to use semaphores instead of conditional variables. Uh, um, could you please kind of... Um, uh, uh, well, just let, let's suppose I have a simple problem like a queue and other thread uh, put events in queue and they just want to wake up and start to process stuff. Uh, how semaphore is better? So you could, so what I'm... What I try to say specifically is that we could potentially, I think, implement PI support easier for a semaphore than for the conditional variable. We don't have PI support or something like that for semaphores right now. So currently it's the same for me. I will, uh, I've seen this priority inversion. It happens to me. So uh, no use for me for switching to anything else, else at did, the moment. Did you use the semaphores or the conditional variables? Uh, no, just conditional variables. Um, so the semaphores, especially the, the new ones that I have, they work a little differently. So um, I would have to look a bit more closely whether you might be less likely to run into a parity inversion problem. So the semaphores don't use an internal lock or something like that. So it's basically you wake one up and whoever grabs the, grabs the token first wins. Of course, this can be still kind of you know unfair, for example, if low priority threats are running. But what I really try to say is that the semaphore might be easy to, for the semaphore we might have an easier time giving you PI support. And I think for the queue example you mentioned, the semaphore, if you really need to wait for just something being available to, available to consume, then this sounds like a semaphore to me. Okay, thank you very much. I think I'll Google more from it. <laughs> <laughs> we should discuss offline, it's just too complicated to do it, you know. Offhand. So I spotted this interesting 64-bit uh, Futex operation thing. I mean, it has been discussed in the past. Uh, Linux, Linus shot it down back then, uh, but he most um, the main reason why he shot it down was because Ulrich was not able to explain it proper. That's true. So I, I, if I read the email conversation, yeah. and I think, so if I may interrupt you here, I think the problem is that it's going back to um, mutexes and stuff like that. There are flags, essentially, if you look at it, right? They are either acquired, not acquired, or, you know, do I have tokens in the semaphore available or not? Right. This year is a sequence. Right. And that's different, right? Yeah. I mean, and the, the, you can argue whether, you know, 32-bit are sufficient to avoid an ABA, but, you know, it's hard, you know, telling a customer that, oh, you shouldn't wait three months and have something for suspended I mean, or not running for two months. Then you I mean, get this ABA and you get a and, dialogue and, or something. That and we, we definitely can't do PI and sequences in 32-bit. In that, doesn't, that doesn't work at all. It's true as well. So the, I have the 64-bit few texts in there because then we reliably and practice could version our few taxes so that we can avoid all kinds of ABA. And it also would make it easier in some cases to, to use Fujix words for something that are pointers if we would not need that. Okay, but uh, I mean, I'm not totally opposed, but 
what frightens me is that we might have to replicate the whole Futex code once more, which... <laughs> no. <laughs> so... It's just it's just one possible approach. There are yeah. others. Maybe we really need to do more of weight queues, build more weight queues in user space or something like that. So do something closer to what Java has done with park and unpark. Uh, okay. So, I mean, if you come up with something which just uses this, has some special functionality for using that 64-bit variant for sim special simple operation, then we can certainly do it. I, I think one of, the, one of the issues though too is even if we did do the 64-bit, we'd still not have solved the PI problem because when we'd be back to the 32-bit problem but with PI because the other 32 bits are the TID and the waiters. Um, yeah, but, but we, you could argue that, okay, the 32-bit on PI is sufficient enough. But in, but in any case, um, but in any case, I would rather do a custom one custom Futex op than right. all of the ops again in 64. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, but that only um, makes sense if we can come up with something which requires that 64-bit thing for a particular operation, and the rest of the operations still operate on 32. So for for the normal stuff, it certainly you know would be sufficient. We probably also don't need the the special ops that we have right now, like maybe ReQ or the PI stuff for 64-bit. For um, we might be, depending on what kind of requirements we actually put in terms of PI and on the, on the convar, to be able to solve it with a 64-bit. Because if we assume that the incoming signal always has high enough priority, then all the signal needs to do is ReQ onto uh, a PI mutex that is the, the program supplied PI mutex. Right. And then if we have the, the problem solved for the versioning, then we don't need to do the quiescent stuff. So it may solve it if we have something like a 64-bit reQ or something, just thinking out loud. So maybe there would be an option. Yeah, you pick the most complex call. <laughs> I said a simple one. <laughs> <laughs> no, but... Uh, as Peter said, I, I mean, if we can help with, with something doing atomic uh, wake weight uh, switch over, that would be rather simple. Unlock weight. What? Unlock weight. Unlock weight. Wake. Wake weight or unlock weight, yeah. That was the other problem they have. So the, the other problem that causes the spurious wake ups is that with their mutex implementation, they do not know if there are waiters, so they always have to issue the Futex system call unconditionally, which is not good for performance, because then you waste a hundred or odd cycles doing a no op syscall. And in the worst case, uh, cause these spurious wake-ups. So on that respect, the, the um, lock and unlock ops Wyman proposed aren't that weird either. But Right, though I think that I'm not quite sure I understood you correctly, but for the current implementation I have, the uh, we we already try to avoid the few text wakes as much as possible. I still have a few cases where I need to implement yeah, yeah. it, but yeah, we do the usual complex, stuff with the, is yeah. the, you know having a bit for whether they are waiters and stuff like that. Yeah, I know, but there's these edge conditions, and, and it makes it rather more complex than it needs to be. It's a little complex, yeah. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> so, uh, if 64-bit for some thing, and we have to come up with a, a proper explanation why we really need it and why it helps you, um, uh, I guess we can. I'm not opposed, and I guess we can get it past Linux as well if we come up with something sensible and not just. Uh, I want to have it because I'm, yeah. I'm Ulrich. The previous explanation that I saw wasn't uh, wasn't convincing. He probably had his reasons, but uh, it. Uh, yeah. I w probably wouldn't have been convinced if I've been Linux. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, any other questions on that Futex stuff, or any other questions at all? Thank you both for coming here, preparing that. Thank you.